And if there's no Quran from the 7th century, that means Muhammad had nothing to do with it. And we are destroying Muhammad and the Quran in one fell swoop. Ooh, I love it. Folks, we got to be the first one to introduce it and get it into the public sphere. Because I hope and I really wish I would like to see Islam destroyed in my lifetime. And I say it, I say it on radio, I say this on TV, I say it to all my Muslim friends. Be confident in what you say and say it passionately because that will make much more of an impact for a Muslim than if you say timidly or shy or reservedly. It all begins with Abd al-Malik. So who is Abd al-Malik? He was the caliph from 685 to 705. He is the one that is known as the great Arab reformer. He takes and creates an identity for Arabs. And what do you do when you try to create an identity for Arabs? Remember, they had already taken over Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo, these cities that are all over the Levant. They had now taken over all of North Africa, gone all the way to, to India in the east and Spain in the west. This they did by the end of the 7th century. But all their traditions were dependent on Judeo-Christian prophets. All their traditions come the line of Isaac. And they're not from that line. They needed a prophet who comes from Ishmael. So what do you do? You create a prophet. And you redact it back to the man who started the conquest. And we know that Muhammad is historical. He is the one that begins the conquests. He dies in 632. But if he's a prophet, he has to have a book. Four pages dated from 568 to 645. Now, Hatu, when did Muhammad, when was he born? So he was born in 570. So these are two years before Muhammad was born, right? Two years before Muhammad born, and you have the Quranic folios. You have the Quranic folios. Jay Smith! Okay, hold on a minute. Let's continue on. No, no debate today. You just listen. No debate today. You just listen. So here we go, Hatun. You have now four pages of the Quran that are dated two years before Muhammad is born. Do these come from Muhammad? Through all of the criticisms that there have been of the Quran and all the speculations there have been regarding the compilation of the Quran within Western scholarship, some which say that the Quran actually began earlier than the Muslims say it began, or some which say that the whole history of it actually went another 200 years after the time of the Prophet Muhammad. None of those are actually grounded in studies of the available manuscripts. As more and more manuscripts have become available, we've been able to confirm with greater and greater accuracy, scientifically, as empirically as one can, that the story that the Muslims have of the compilation of the Quran is, for the most part, accurate. As Karl Ernst has said, it is a better explanation of the data that we have available to us than any other theory that anyone has proposed. The most recent manuscript that was found and the earliest manuscript of the, of the Quran ever to be found are the ones that were found in Sana'a, in Yemen, in the old mosque in Sana'a. And there was a lot of speculation when those manuscripts were first found. In fact, there was an article in the Atlantic Monthly about how this was going to tell us new things about the history of the Quran. Well, 
Nobody had studied them at that point. This was just speculation. Now they've been studied, not all of them, but at least one folio has gone, undergone rigorous analysis. And that rigorous analysis has demonstrated through carbon dating, one, that that manuscript does come at about the time when Muslims say the Quran was compiled. But then there's even an underscript of the Quran that's shown that's on the parchment. What happens is in the old days, when you used parchment, if you wanted to write something new on it, you didn't throw out the parchment because it was so expensive. You would erase what was on there, and then you would write something new. Now, the inks were also partially metal-based. So through infrared photography, we can actually get an image of what that Arabic script was that was on that parchment before the Quran as we know it was written on that parchment. That infrared photography has shown us that the suras as we know them were there and intact. Furthermore, they even show that the slight variations that are in the text are ones that Muslims have attested. There wasn't anything that one could call a variant that Muslims had not attested was a variant of the Quran that had been transmitted by some Muslims. Now, the other thing is, if you think about it, if somebody were to make up a history of the text, you wouldn't have made it up the way that Muslims have the history written down. You would have said, well, it was written at this time, and then it was put down under the time of the Prophet Muhammad, and alhamdulillah, that was that. You wouldn't say, well, first, after he died, they didn't have it written down. Then, under the Caliphate of Abu Bakr, it was written in one form, and then, a few years later, around the year 650, it was put down in another compilation, and this was the final compilation. Nobody would make up that story. So even there, it is just, it is really an act of distrust on the part of the Orientalists to try to find different histories, A, than what the Muslims first accounted for, and B, what the manuscripts actually tell us. And I really wish, I would like to see Islam destroyed in my lifetime. And I say it, I say it on radio, I say this on TV, I say it to all my Muslim friends. Muslims need to be careful when they see these folios that are dated from, look at the dates, 568, so that's two years before the birth of Muhammad, up to 645, that is a good 10 years and more after the death of Muhammad. That in and of itself is problematic, because those dates do not correspond with the classical account. They have this rough dating that they've carbon dated. The pages, the, 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 the parchment that's written on from, I think it's around like 560 to 648 or something of that effect. Which is, by the way, you know, the Prophet's lifetime is about 570 to 632. So, you know, this is not like from the 500s, it's not from, you know, the 400s. I mean, if, if you take, if, if you insist that this parchment has to be from the various early, very earliest part of that window, and you insist that the parchment was used right away. So you can imagine, you know, you go to the store and you buy paper. That paper was produced, was made, I don't know how long ago, maybe a year ago, maybe six months ago. Who knows how long? I mean, I have paper sitting in my office that have, from 2005, you know, from, from when I printed my dissertation. So, I mean, I, the, the point is that it, it, if you insist that, that, that this paper, this parchment was made in the earlier part of that window, and if you insist that it was made and then immediately used to write the stuff down, um, then you could say that the Quran comes from before the life of the Prophet. But that's not, nothing in the evidence we have suggests that at all. In Where fact, I give lots of examples. Where Sorry, did you get yeah? the statement he said? Radio and in the air would, uh, with, you know, whatever. Use it right away? And then use it immediately. They, they, they no, but they're just, again, I, there's no evidence for that. Like, he just says that. <laughs> I mean, why? Why, why do you, well, look, what possible evidence do you have for that? Yeah. And then the evidence that other people said in defense of him is, oh, why would you leave perfectly good parchment unused? I don't know. Why would I leave perfectly good paper unused in my, in my office for, for 10 years now? Mm -hmm. I use paper all the time. I don't know because people don't use, I mean, this is, 
your your kind of early 21st century assumption that people used it immediately is first of all not true in the 21st century why would it be true in the in the 7th century what evidence do we possibly especially given and I have an example of this that people would all the time we have for example the swiss article of federation which i which are supposed to be dated they date themselves to 1291 but the scholars think that they're done in the, the written in the 1800s but the um, radio dating of the manuscript, the, the paper that it's on, is from it dates in the mid 1200s. So, it's it's between 50 and 100 years. The document is between 50 and 100 years after the production of that paper, and this is just a, a political document. So my point is that, you know, what possible, you know, what why should I accept that this was used immediately? You have no evidence for that. You have you don't even have any evidence. This is like for example, if you said. In general, Arabs did this because, look, we have all these books with, of Arabs talking about how they produce parchment and use it, and they have, you know, a, a, a study guide and a, a book on how to deal with paper and books, and we see what they're. We don't have any. Of, we have no data whatsoever. There's no not information. So you're just you're just out of the blue saying Arabs to do this. That's like me saying Arabs used to, you know, scratch their ears with their pinks. I don't know. I mean, why? I mean, I have no data for that. Why? I could just, I could claim anything I want. So, uh, and again, absolutely no evidence. So, uh, you know, if you, in, in order to, and then what I think is very interesting is that these Quran pages, these Mus'haf pages, they're, first of all, you have diverse dividers, dividers between the verses, mm -hmm. and also div dividers between the surahs. And it's more drawn in later because you can see that the the text is actually wider apart uh, for the surah dividers and where the verse dividers are. So someone can say, "Oh, I came." Someone added those in later. Okay, but the, the, the text is written around to have these things in there. And what the, the crazy thing is that even the Muslim accounts of the the the, the musahif, the copies of the Quran sent out by the Caliph Uthman, they didn't have surah dividers in them. So what you're saying is, not only did the Quran predate the Prophet, but even the Surah divisions predate the Prophet, and that then later on the Muslims didn't have the Surah divisions. So you're basically saying, oh well, they were trying to, they were they were so interested in trying to make it look like this book ad was their new book that they erased the Surah divisions that already existed and they pretended that they weren't there, which is absurd. So. Uh, there, the everything about this, this Birmingham pages suggests that you have a parchment that's between I think it was five sixty and like six forty or something around that. I can't remember the exact dates. And yeah, and okay, so I have an idea. Maybe there's a parchment that's produced during that time, and then is used either during that time or a few years later to write down a copy of the Quran, which would be exactly what the normal, the existing consensus of scholars, both Western scholars and Muslim scholars is. That's exactly what they would say. They'd say, yeah, the Quran comes from, is, you know, basically composed during the life of the prophet. It's written down in semi form in the years after his death, and it's promulgated officially around 650, which would be exactly what this whole, this Birmingham suggests. You know, is this thing he wrote about the the Birmingham Quran pages, uh, which you know I, I think you read the thing I wrote. But I mean, so I, I don't want to. You know, I guess the people listening can just go read it. Read me easier than me summarizing it. But basically, but basically, you know, again, is that you know he's making he gets on the radio and he makes this really kind of confident claim in, in a British accent. He just sounds very educated and you know very haughty and saying, well, you know, this is really this really undermines you know really questions a lot about. The origins of Islam, and they suggest that the Quran actually might predate the Prophet Muhammad. And so you're hearing that, and you, you know, imagine just a lay person or a, someone. Why should they not believe it? You know, this is crazy. This is a respected scholar saying this. And so what I actually what I show is that the the number of things you have to believe, basically on no evidence, in order to hold that position that the Quran comes from before the Prophet Muhammad, the number of things you have to believe are so extreme and so many that it's actually much easier just to say that the 
the Quran comes from the time of the Prophet. I mean, which is not an outrageous claim, right? It's not. not I'm not saying the Quran was, you know, came down from heaven in you know a ball of fire and there was this golden book that was levitating around or something like that, or you know, it smelled like cheesecake. I'm not saying. I'm not making it. I mean, this is just saying this it book is life. comes from the life of the Prophet. You know, this was. You know, even if even if you think he made it up. He was still made up during his, you know, around his lifetime, or was promulgated around 650. So again, I'm not, you know, no metaphysical claims are being made here, uh, and yet that's just not that's that's not acceptable to to a lot of revisionists. They they have to go back and say, no, this can't be true. So the number of things you have to believe in order to to accept that the Quran comes that this Birmingham, these pages of this Birmingham Musaf come from before the Islam are so extreme that. It, Basically, for me, that's that's a religious position. If you if you if what you say is religion is about accepting things based on faith and not on evidence, not on empirical evidence, then that's what Tom Holland is asking you to do. He's asking you to believe something just because you have this this unwavering conviction that the Muslims' version of their own religion cannot be true. It has to be made up, and that for me is dogmatic. It's not real scholarship. The what's called revisionist school of thought about early Islamic history gets pride of place and prioritized by American and European newspapers and journals and things like that. Uh, what does that mean by revisionist? I mean, people who basically a school of thought which, which basically says that the the generally accepted version of how Islam arose as a religion, and this has you know this has nothing to do with whether someone's Muslim or not. I mean. The, in general, Western scholars basically accept the overall outline for you know who the prophet was, when he lived, what he taught. Right? They might debate. They'll debate the, the details of certain hadiths, whether this hadith is true or not, things like that. But in general, they say you know the overall structure of his life is, is not really questioned. The, the dating of the Quran is not really questioned. These things have been well established in Western scholarship. But revisionism is a school that really came into being in the late 1970s. But it's uh, it's gotten kind of beaten down really uh, severely because it, uh, it 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 constantly uh, gets disproven. Um, for example, one scholar who actually died this this last year, or just this recently, actually Patricia Krona, a Danish scholar who was working at the Princeton Institute for Advanced Studies, she had written you know numerous books. One, I mean, one thing she claimed was that the the Hijra dating system didn't start until much later. And then they found a you know a rock inscription in Saudi Arabia dated to the year 13 Hijra in the Caliphate of Omar and talking about the Caliph Omar and you know with the year 13 Hijra. So you you kept finding evidence that proved the claims of revisionists wrong, and uh, and so you know for example in the late 1990s I remember when I was in college there was this Atlantic Monthly article that had a cover on a picture of the Quran on the cover and it said. You know, what is the Quran? It had this mic, this mic, uh, this magnifying glass slicing through the Quran. It said, you know, scholars are discovering things about the origins of the Quran that are questioning everything about Islam. Mm -hmm. And it was about these documents that had been found, these very old manuscripts that had been found in Sana'a in Yemen, and saying, you know, it was a German scholar who was saying that, you know, we've, you know, these these documents, these pages from early Quran uh, copies are question, calling into question our everything we know about the Quranic text. And then it turned out to be nothing. I mean, we, we when people actually looked at these manuscripts, they were totally, they were not any different than other Mus'afs. They were, some of them were later than people had claimed. And the one that was really early just confirmed actually that not only was, not only, it was actually a pre-Uthmanic Mus'af. What does that mean? It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, a, a pages from a Mus'af that comes from before the time when Uthman, the Caliph Uthman, promulgated the Quran in around 650. So, and, and that version, those pages aren't any different from, don't, they don't have any more differences from the standard version of the Quran than there are differences amongst the various readings of the, of the standard version of the Quran, right? So there's seven generally not considered canonical readings of the Quran. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this, this pre-Ithmanic Mus'haf pages, these, they don't really differ from what the established readings are. So basically, all that was just a bunch of noise, and in the end, it turned out to be nothing. 
So, but but yet these things, you know, you'll always see every every year or so you'll see some newspaper article in the New York Times or something about how someone's uncovered these early Qurans and it's going to shed light on the origins of Islam and you know, scholars have to be tread. Oh, I remember the Atlantic Monthly. It said scholars must tread very carefully. That's what it said on the cover. You know, because these crazy Muslims, they're gonna you know, they're gonna overreact and Lord knows what's going to happen. So it would I, I, this stuff. It really makes me upset because. You know, I don't as as a scholar and as someone you know, I went to graduate school, I got a PhD at the University of Chicago and I you know, I, I'm Muslim and I I didn't force my faith on other people and I didn't accept I didn't require people to accept my you know, my beliefs or or ex expect them to consider what I believe to be true without giving them evidence that they accepted, right? So I, I didn't I, I always had to keep my faith separate from my, my scholarship. And then you see, you know, people like Tom Holland or other scholars, revisionist scholars coming and basically, in effect, ignoring evidence, ignoring what has been like the, you know, landslide after landslide of evidence, and instead just insisting on, no, the origins of Islam are different than what everyone says they are. They have to be different. And so what upsets me is what you're, basi what you're saying is you are basically ignoring evidence and you're insisting on a certain perspective despite the evidence. So how is that any different than what people who are religious are accused of doing? They're accused of ignoring evidence ignore, and not being rational and just insisting on their version of history and their faith and their sacred history. So what, what, I, what upsets me is, and especially, of course, it's the revisionists who are the most snide and the most condescending to Muslims. When I really wish I would like to see Islam destroyed in my lifetime, and I say it, I say it on radio, I say this on TV, I say it to all my Muslim friends. Be confident in what you say and say it passionately because that will make much more of an impact for a Muslim than if you say timidly or shy or reservedly.